Richard, Professor Richard Sullivan, King's College, London. Uh, thank you for giving us a few minutes. Um, Institute of Cancer Policy. This is a really exciting new initiative. Tell us about it. Well, the Institute of Cancer Policy has come about from a sort of 10-year history of developing the whole area of cancer policy and global public health. And it was clear when we started something called the European Cancer Research Managers Forum back in early 2001 that there was a real niche area for doing evidence-based cancer policy making um, on a global scale, not just for high-income countries, but also to deal with the ever-growing expansion of, of cancer burden in low-middle-income countries. Um, and over the last couple of years, with um, a pump priming grant from the Umberto Veronese Foundation, we've been developing this new concept um, in partnership with eCancer and a number of other key partners to put an Institute of Cancer Policy, which will bring together faculty with expertise in a variety of different methods, econometrics, scientometrics, sociology, to really look at all the key issues in cancer policy and provide policymakers essentially with evidence-based policy making. Okay, and that's global? It's global it's indeed it is, yeah, absolutely. Initiative. It's not just so, European. So just break down these etrics for mm. us one at a time for yeah. So within the people. Institute of Cancer Policy, the, the unique selling point, if you like, the unique aspects of, of the new institute will be to bring together people with very, very different expertise and methods for objectively looking at cancer policy globally. Um, first of all, expertise in uh, health economics relevant to cancer, so particularly with our partners at the University of Oxford, um, looking at the scientometrics, and by that we mean actually the state of research and development, publications, patterns, um, social media analysis, for instance, to see what's hot, um, expertise in sociology as well, because the sociological effects, of the cultural effects of cancer are very important and can be quantifiably analysed using some very interesting and novel tools, particularly interesting from evolutionary psychology. And all these individuals, of course, sit in different areas, but they're being brought under the umbrella of the Institute of Cancer Policy to be focused on key emerging hot topics. Okay. So if I gave you a, a topic such as poverty, mm. uh, what would you do with that? Mm. Because so, I know that poor people and ill-educated people get yes. more cancer and die yes. uh, quicker yeah. of it. Yeah. So the key thing is when, when we're dealing with a particular issue like poverty and inequity is to make sure first of all that it's grounded in very, very firm epidemiology and demographic data so you really understand what the current burden is and also how it's going to play out in particular countries and systems over the next 10, 20 years. In other words, the fit to political lifestyle um, cycles. So that's one important aspect that the Institute of Cancer Policy will do, which is future modelling. But more than that, we'll also bring together experts from different domains. So there are people who work in the sociology of inequity, ideas of distributed justice like Amitara Sen, and we bring those sorts of individuals together to really tackle these issues from very, very different paradigms and viewpoints. And it's by bringing together this expertise that you can provide policymakers with very, very rich, deep dive intelligence and policy making. And solutions? Absolutely. I mean, the key with all this is solutions. However, having said that, what the Institute of Cancer Policy isn't going to be doing is advocacy. At the end of the day, advocacy and actually driving forward change is about political prioritisation. And that rightly belongs in the domain of individual countries, patient organisations, professional bodies who are there to make the political prioritisation decisions around cancer policy making. And in a sense, what the Institute of Cancer Policy does is provide them with the necessary framework and intelligence to make those sorts of evidence-based prioritisation decisions. Now, you're uh, um, basking in the, the, the glory of the Lancet uh, uh, tome, <laughs> which many of us contributed to, on, uh, on sort of the, the, the well-off countries and, and the costs of cancer care. Um, presumably, there's not a lot of money around to pay for a similar sort of a, a study in, in low-income countries or emerging countries. Mm. And yet they have to be a target for you. Absolutely. I mean, one of the most critical issues at the moment we're dealing with is, is the general economic burden of cancer. Um, after the Lancet Oncology Commission, we're now working on a very high-resolution piece of work to look at um, the cancer economic burden in EU27. So that's both direct health care costs, but also informal costs, mortality loss and morbidity. 
And the difference with this study is, of course, we're, we're doing it in much higher resolution and we're not censoring for, for ageing populations, etc. Now, there's a lot of data that's been put out in the public domain on the economic burden in low- and middle-income countries, particularly emerging economies. Most of it is wrong because the problem is they haven't been able to quantify the out-of-pocket expenses. And in the global economic burden, they account for something between 60 and 80 percent of expenditure. So there's a real need actually now, particularly in the emerging economies, South Africa, Brazil, India, China, to start putting this sort of research in place to look at the economic burden in these countries, because that's absolutely key for policymakers, Treasury. Sure. Who's going to pay for this? Sure. What's an out-of-pocket uh, expense for somebody in Chile or in Venezuela? Yeah, so an out-of-pocket expense in, in Venezuela and Chile, for example, is anywhere between about 37% in somewhere like Chile, which is reasonable social basis of medicine there, to somewhere in Venezuela it can be up to 70-80% of their oh, care costs. What would costs. that be? So that's actually having to, to pay directly to the hospital, mm -hmm. to the surgeon, for their radiotherapy, and particularly for their, for their drugs. Yeah. Very, very few people are, are paid for their medicines uh -huh. from a social system. But generally speaking, outside high-income countries, most people have to pay for their own care. Yeah. And uh, you mentioned uh, the, the developments in Africa, and you've just been to yeah. Africa lately, and there's a, a real enthusiasm there for yeah. taking up this sort of uh, methodology. Yeah, absolutely. So we've been working very closely with the South Africans um, ICON, which is the Independent Clinical Oncology Network, their Department of Health, and also one of their big patient groups called Cancer. Um, the South Africans are going through a huge revolution in their, in their healthcare system. They're creating a much more NHS social healthcare system, and alongside that, a completely new cancer plan. And they're quite clear as an emerging economy that they have a lot of structural issues within the country and what they're looking for is partners to help them frame and also develop the intelligence for what they need to do in terms of putting forward a national cancer plan which is going to have real teeth and more importantly they're going to actually be able to deliver affordable cancer care. Yeah. You know this is a country where we're talking quadruple disease burden here across all age cohorts and across all socio-economic systems and classes. So cancer is not the only fruit here. They're still dealing with HIV AIDS and infectious disease and maternal mortality. So the system has to be really, really cost effective for it to work. And you were mentioning that, uh, that the other African states are now looking more to South Africa mm -hmm. for leadership. Yeah, one of the things is I think I think it's clear when you when you're thinking about the sort of the culture of, of policy making, global public health and cancer, that people like to feel empowered, that it's not something that's being imposed to them from high income countries. And to be frank, actually the, the trajectory we've had in our healthcare systems for cancer in high income countries, what we can really teach other emerging economies is the failures really, where we've got it wrong. We have very few set successes to really export. And at the end of the day, the solutions for Africa are going to be MIA. They're going to be made in Africa. Yeah. And you need to find certain countries that will act in that leadership role to really develop cost-effective care and also the new prevention approaches, which are fit for purpose for those countries. And for Venezuela and Chile, it's going to be MISA made it, in South America. Exactly, exactly. And people, and I think if you're going to see a real change in these systems that people are going to take forward in a sustainable way, they have to feel that it's something they own. Yeah. and the leadership comes from there. But obviously they, it's important as well to have the knowledge transfer so they can understand the mistakes we've made with our cancer policy making. Mm. Richard, Institute of Cancer Policy, uh, success. And uh, we'll hear more about it in uh, eCancer's uh, pages and videos. Absolutely. Good Thank luck. you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Gordon.